about the new construction. And this section will have two talks. The next talk is, the title is Short Malleable Calls from Related Key Secure Tickable Block Cipher Revisited. And the talk will be given by the speaker Antonio Fanio from, from France. So let's welcome Antonio Fanio. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, could you all uh, hear me loud and clear? Yes. Oh, perfect. So I'm going to start. So uh, good morning again. Uh, so I'm going to present this uh, joint uh, work with uh, Gianluca Bryan, uh, Joao Ribeiro, and Daniel Venturi. I'm Antonio Faonio uh, right now in France at 3 a.m. So, uh, you know, excuse me if sometime I look a bit sleepy. I would. Okay. So, a uh, brief history of uh, this project. So, uh, this project uh, start around here where you see my mouse. Oops. Oh, I guess now you do. Can you still hear me loud and clear? Well, I cannot hear you guys. Sorry, I will have to pause a second. Okay, sorry, uh, I'm back. Okay, so as I was saying, this project start around here where you can see my mouse. And in around here, we discover about uh, this nice paper, paper by uh, Fair, Cartman and Manic. And this paper is about uh, non-malleable code. And it has some nice, interesting uh, new uh, security property from, uh, from the block ciphers. So from which we they can construct an, a new non-malleable code. And since we were interested in non-malleability, we decided to use the framework to, you know, uh, yet uh, another project, a different project uh, uh, from the one that I'm presenting right now on, uh, uh, on non-malleability. So we write a paper, we wrote a paper, we submitted it to task 21. Uh, everything seemed to work well until the reviewer arrived uh, the reviewers were kind of nice, and they were so nice that uh, they we even found an attack on our paper. Uh, and by the way, this attack was not just an attack on our paper, but it was also an attack on the uh, 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 um, cryptographic assumption of this paper from uh, uh, Fair, Kaufman, uh, and many. And so we were here, kind of uh, in a uh, you know. And in a crossroad, we had to decide what to do. And what we decided to do was to fix the paper from FKM18. And so that's what we did. We fixed that paper. Uh, we, uh, so the reviewer C pointed us to some other attacks, to the attack that was originally uh, by Bernstein in 2010. And then it was uh, uh, extended and formalized by uh, Albert Farshin, Patterson, and Watson in 11. So we read that, uh, these papers and uh, we went back uh, to work and we fixed uh, the FKMA uh, uh, paper. We submitted it again at task 22 and I'm here presenting it. So I guess uh, this is a, 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 a nice uh, a story, a nice story of uh, the uh, reviewing process. Yeah. By the way, thanks to the reviewer, the anonymous reviewer. So this paper is about non-malleable code. A non-malleable code is an encoding scheme. So through an encoding scheme, you can encode a message, uh, and then you can decode the message by correctness. If you encode a message, you decode the same message. And the important property from a non-malleable code is this uh, non-malleability property. This non-malleability property says that if you encode a message and then there is a tampering function 
that modify your message and they get a new code word C tilde, and then you try to decode this C tilde, you obtain a message M tilde, and now this message M tilde is either the same message of before, which means that the stumbling function didn't do much, or if it is another uh, different uh, code word, it has to be completely uncorrelated with respect to the uh, original code word. So it's easy to see that the normalable code uh, are impossible without any further restriction. In fact, if uh, someone uh, has a full power of a tampering function that can decode this, the, the code word, and for example, uh, for example, add to the message plus one, and then encode again the code word, this code word C tilde will be the message underline this code word C tilde that will be highly correlated to the original message. Uh, so we need to put some uh, restriction on the kind of tampering function. And the kind of restriction that uh, uh, are considered in the, in, the, uh, in the literature is this uh, one of the kind of con uh, condition that are considered in the literature is this uh, speed state model, where basically we assume that the code word can be parsed in two parts, C0 and C1. And now the tampering function are applied separately on C0 and C1. So there is a tampering function F0 on C0 and a tampering function F1 on C1. And these two tampering functions are independent. They don't, do not communicate. And, uh, and then, you know, the, the same the game of uh, the normalability. And this and in this uh, model, we can construct uh, normalable codes. And indeed, the paper of uh, F, uh, of uh, Fair, Cartman and Manik present a very interesting uh, normalable code in uh, uh, in this setting. So they consider a, a very nice and intuitive uh, uh, scheme, which uh, based on uh, Doc Cipher, which basically say, okay, let's encode a message by sampling a fresh random key, and then by using a block cipher as a PRP to uh, encode the message by, you know, uh, creating a cipher text uh, using the block ciphers uh, on K key and on the, on the message that we want to encode. And then the decoding function is the trivial thing. You take back your key and you decode by decrypting. And they, the, 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 the point of this paper was uh, uh, by looking at this natural non-malleable code, what are the security properties that we need from the block cipher so that this normalable code is secure? And the two security properties that they uh, came up with and that were sufficient for, for the work were a PRP with leakage, meaning a PRP that is leakage resilient, and a notion they call it the fixed relay key security. And the attack that I mentioned at the very beginning of this talk uh, break this fixed related key security. So let's go to see this uh, uh, notion a bit uh, more uh, in detail. So this notion basically says that uh, there is a, a game in which uh, you know there is the, the fresh key. Uh, the fresh key can be tampered, and you can create a key key tilde, which is you know the tampered key. And now the adversary can be two different words. In the real world, he gets to play with a, a left oracle in which there is the original key and the PRP, and in the right world, there is the uh, tampered key. He can interact with these two uh, uh, oracle. Now, instead, in the in the ideal world, he can play with a, a random permutation on one side and uh, with another random permutation on the other side. Now, if the two keys are the different, then the two random permutations has to be different. And also there is a constraint on the uh, tampered key. So the tampered key cannot be uh, too probable. Uh, so uh, another way to say is that the function, the tampering function cannot have too many uh, fixed points. And this is uh, a, a necessary uh, condition. Now that uh, we see the, uh, the notion, let's see what is the attack proposed by Bernstein and then uh, uh, formalized by FPW11 and uh, from the, uh, you know, that we got to know through the reviewer. So the attack uh, is uh, a bit contrived from my point of view. Uh, 
So the attack uh, should uh, set the pumper key as the uh, block cipher on the original key uh, executed on message equal to 0000, or any fixed uh, value is okay. And this is why I say that it's a bit contrived because you know in the in, in the literature of uh, actual tampering attack, uh, this kind of tampering function seems a bit uh, you know a bit out of uh, the the capability of what a tampering function can do. But nevertheless, in a theoretical framework, this uh, tampering function is, um, is 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 a perfectly okay function. Now that we set the tamper key in this way, the attack works in two phases. So the first phase is the extract phase and the second phase is the check phase. And in the extract phase, what happened is that uh, the uh, adversary can query his left oracle uh, with the message 0000. Now, if it is, if the adversary is in the real world, by, by querying it with this message, what it happens is that it will extract from the uh, uh, oracle the uh, tampered key. Instead, if it's in, in the real world, well, what happens is that it will get a, a random value. Uh, then there is a second part of the attack, which is called the check step. In this check step, what it does is that now I have my key, which is the tampered key, most probably if, I, if I'm in the real world, and I'm just going to check that is indeed the uh, tumbled key. So I locally can uh, encrypt uh, a message, uh, for example, 111 uh, with, uh, with my key. And then I query the tumbled oracle to see if uh, what I encrypted match what, what the uh, oracle tells me. And if I'm in the real world, this uh, check will hold uh, with probability one. If I'm in the real in the ideal world, instead this check will hold with probability uh, very low. So I can distinguish between these two words, and this is the, this attack. Uh, so the notion of uh, FRK uh, security uh, is, uh, is doesn't hold. So what we did uh, uh, in our work was to try to fix the notion of fixed related key security. And we did it through two fixes. Uh, the first fix is trying to avoid the extraction step of the Bernstein attack. So the, to do that, we avoid, uh, we uh, delete the uh, oracle access of the adversary to the left oracle, meaning the oracle with the original key. Of course, if you, to you talk of this oracle now, maybe the notional uh, uh, become trivials, so we still want to give information to the adversary about the original key. And uh, to do that, we uh, uh, take the game and we divide it in you know a two phases game. In the first phase, a uh, distribution sampler uh, can uh, sample a, a bunch of uh, messages which are to be random, but uh, not uniformly random. They just have uh, to have some ent entropy. Uh, it sample these messages. And, and then in the, uh, the challenger, either encrypt the messages with the, with, a, with, a, with the block cipher, or you will encrypt the messages with a random permutation. And then the second phase of the game starts. Now, through to this, uh, this fix, we know we assure that the, the adversary cannot perform the first step of the attack. Uh, but maybe this is not enough. So what we did next is try to avoid also the second step of the attack. So in the second step of the attack, the adversary can locally test if the extracted key match the tampered key. And there, uh, so it can encrypt the key and then it can go to the right oracle. And if either the right, if the right oracle is the random permutation, uh, the check uh, will not hold. So what we do is that uh, instead of giving oracle access to uh, a random permutation in the in the real world, in the real world we give access to the tampering function uh, to the block cipher uh, on the tampered key itself. So now these two words, beside uh, what are the, the encryption, uh, uh, the, uh, the ciphertext, 
have the same uh, oracle access. So if you want to do a check that uh, depends on the on the on the on the uh, um, on on the oracle, this check should should uh, uh, give the same answer, right? So in this way, we try to avoid uh, the, the second part of the attack. Uh, uh, of course, this uh, this might be not enough. Uh, so we propose these two fixes. Uh, oh no, sorry. Okay, yeah, here I am. So now, if you look at this uh, fix, uh, we also gain some simplicity in the definition because in the, the original definition uh, there was the point in which. Uh, the constraint in which uh, you know the tampering function cannot have too many uh, fixed points, uh, and the point was that uh, 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 this condition was necessary because uh, there was this, uh, there is another attack in which uh, you know if the tampering function has a lot of uh, fixed point, what I can do is that uh, for example, let's suppose that there is a, a, a k k bar which is very probable. I can just uh, assume that uh, uh, in the real world I got access to uh, tampering uh, to the to the block cipher with this uh, uh, key bar uh, uh, key set. So I can just check uh, if it is indeed the, the key that I'm that I'm uh, um, working with, and if in, if in, if I am in the real world, this probability is quite high. And therefore, I can distinguish between the real world and the ideal world. And because of uh, uh, this attack, uh, uh, we had uh, in the in the original definition we had to have this constraint. But now, in the new definition, we have in both cases uh, uh, oracle access to the to the the block cipher with the tamper key. So this attack does not hold. So this attack does not hold, and therefore we don't need this constraint. Okay, so just to summarize, uh, the entropic fixed related key, a security notion that we put forward in this work, uh, just uh, you know, is uh, very similar to the previous one. There is the stamper key, then there is a bunch of messages that are sampled from a distribution. This message has to be random, but uh, they don't have to be uniformly random, just that they need to have some entropy. And then the adversary can play with a, a tampering oracle. And he can distinguish, he has to distinguish uh, uh, if he got uh, some. Uh, Good ciphertext, so some real ciphertext, or some you know ciphertext made with a random permutation. There are also some corner case, but uh, you can see the paper for the details. So our first result is to show in the uh, uh, ideal cipher model that uh, our definition holds true. So by doing that, we assure that there are no black box attack on uh, our definition which means that our definition should be secure. It should be secure as in practice. And uh, okay, so in the ideal cipher model, uh, we consider this uh, uh, the same definition of before, but we also give Oracle access to the adversary to this ideal cipher. And the most important part is that we also give access to the tampering function to the, uh, uh, to the uh, ideal cipher. This is very important. Because you know the, the attack of Bernstein worked because the function had uh, capability of uh, computing the, the the block cipher. So we need to have a block cipher dependent tampering function, and in this model we can prove security. As you can see, uh, there are some some numbers here, uh, uh, but uh, I would say it's uh, quite of a tight uh, uh, re reduction. Okay. Next, now that uh, we have a sound uh, and uh, safe uh, assumption, we went back to the idea of uh, uh, F, uh, F, uh, Fair, uh, Karman, and Manik, and uh, we slightly modified the encoding scheme. And so uh, to encode a message, what we do is that we put on the left side, the fresh key, and on the uh, right side, we do an encryption of the message padded with some randomness. So you have a random string that you pad on the message, which because we needed a, a bit of entropy in the messages. This is how we add this bit of entropy. And this is our encoding. So K and the ciphertext uh, uh, sigma. And to decode, we do you know the trivial thing. So we use the key to decrypt, 
we receive a message in some pad, and what we need to do is just to you know remove this pad and output. And we have a theorem which show that uh, if the uh, uh, encryption scheme, well, if the block cipher is uh, uh, in public uh, fixed uh, uh, related key secure, then the normalable code is secure as well. And as you can see, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the result is quite tight. Uh, and here we need to only to have one query to the, uh, to the bumpering oracle and one message to be encrypted. And that's it. Uh, thank you. Uh, so is there any question or comment from Beijing? And maybe from Kobe? Any question or comment from Kobe? Yeah, one question. Okay. Hello. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, so I have one question. So um, your solution is to add the randomness in the primitive. Um, so I'm mm -hmm. barred, by the way. Um, so one thing we thought of when we, we saw the, the issue with the, with the model was to just, instead of um, putting the key in the first part, split the key. And uh, for instance, gamma would consist of like a normal block cipher encryption with one half of the key and the other half would be in the top part. Does that also work? Or do you see what I mean? So, uh, uh, so if you go, could, could you go to one of the beginning slides where you had the picture? Slide four uh, or five. I forgot the number. Uh, maybe here. There, okay. this guy. Yeah, whatever. Okay. So yeah, this guy. So the key, uh, what mm -hmm. happens if you would, for instance, split the key in two and yeah. one half of them is concatenated in the gamma? Would that also work or do you see problems? I, yeah, yeah. We, 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 uh, we, we look at into... Uh, this actually, uh, we we ask uh, uh, Hartman, uh, and uh, I think uh, we 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 couldn't we we couldn't prove it, uh, but uh, we didn't put so much effort also in prove it. But uh, yes, because uh, this this would be another solution, right? Uh, probably would be also a bit more efficient because uh, there is this notion. I'm sorry, I'm not a big expert in block cipher, but uh, this is notion of a tweakable uh, 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 block cipher, which I think would match this notion uh, better, right? Yes, yeah, it's a different, but this comparable solution indeed, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah actually, it would be nice to prove it secure, but uh, we didn't manage uh, to prove it secure. I don't remember a lot of the details, uh, but uh, it was in, in the in the you know in the reduction of uh, uh, to the ideal cipher model, uh, we 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 had it was a bit more complicated to, to handle because uh, in, I mean in our solution we encrypt the key, so we have kind of a, a layer up, um, uh, more of uh, protection because this key is uh, is uh, is encrypted now. But yeah, that would be cool. In fact, okay. Yeah, thank you. I have no other questions. Okay. Yeah, thank you. And um, any question? Any additional question? Maybe due to the time limitation, we can move to the next talk. And if you have a question, you can maybe send an email to the speaker. So okay. thanks, the thank speaker. Ken. So bye. Next, okay, bye. And you can stop sharing your screen. Oh. So yeah, the yes. next talk is uh. SCP mode, semantically secure lens presenting encryption. And the talk will be given by Fabinho uh, Buffy uh, from Switzerland, and he will give the talk in Kobe. So let's welcome the speaker, Fabinho Buffy. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you Hello. Yeah. So hi, thanks for the introduction. My name is Fabio Banfi, and I'm going to present SCB mode, semantically secure length preserving encryption. Uh, okay, it's working. So yes, this is um, um, 
the structure of the presentation, I will begin with some background and motivation. Then I will introduce the concept of length preserving encryption slash enciphering. I will explain later what the difference is. Uh, after that, I will introduce a new scheme, SCB mode, uh, which is a semantically secure LPE. And in the end, we will have conclusions. Uh, so let's start with the background and motivation. So we all know that uh, we usually construct encryption schemes using uh, block, uh, modes of operations, which transform block ciphers into encryption schemes. Thanks. Um, so this seems to be has stopped working now. Thanks. Right. Thanks so much. Uh, sorry about that. So yes, uh, in most of operation, we usually um, have some uh, input message, which, which we uh, assume is composed of blocks of length n. And from this, we then compute a ciphertext, which has usually some expansion. So it's going to be, again, a sequence of blocks of length n plus some uh, lambda bits, where lambda we call this uh, the expansion factor. So a very famous and secure way is, of course, the ECB mode, the electronic code boot mode, where essentially we have zero expansion. And the idea is that we simply encipher every block of the message to obtain our ciphertext. So therefore, again, the length of uh, the ciphertext is going to be the same as the one of the message. On the other hand, a secure way is, for example, CBC, where the expansion factor is exactly the block length n. And the idea here will be to first sample a random block of n bits. This will be actually what accounts for the expansion because this is uh, then included as part of the ciphertext. So these are extra n bits. And then for the, for the remaining blocks, we use the previous block as a pad, and then we encipher the current block of the input message. So again, here we see that the resulting ciphertext has, uh, is formed of L plus one blocks. Uh, and of course, both schemes can actually be adapted with, via a technique called ciphertext stealing into encryption schemes for messages of arbitrary length, not only for messages of length multiple of a block cipher. So uh, let's go to motivation. Now from the previous slides, a uh, question should actually come up naturally. Why isn't it possible to have kind of uh, both of these uh, nice features, namely security in the sense of in CPA security, but also uh, zero expansion or length preservation. Uh, and I want to argue now that this is actually something that might be also useful in practice. What if, for example, we have the following scenario where uh, we have many short messages that need to be transmitted, but communication is expensive. So in more detail, for example, consider a case in which every day we have to transmit some M messages also assume that each message consists of uh, B blocks. This quantity will be defined by the underlying uh, block cipher. Now with a conventional in CPA scheme, uh, the resulting number of transmitted blocks will be M times B plus one. Whereas uh, if we would have an encryption scheme, which is length preserving, so without exp any expansion, the number of transmitted blocks will be just M times B. So now we see that uh, if B is very small compared to M, then the cost kind of, of the secure scheme is twice as much as the one of, uh, of the scheme without expansion. So again, the question is, can we actually avoid expansion but retain semantic security? Uh, well, this is uh, something that seems impossible, but spoiler alert, alert is actually not. So uh, for this, we need to introduce uh, length preserving encryption uh, schemes. So uh, uh, again, this seems to be impossible. So let's see uh, why this is the case. It seems that if uh, we enforce an encryption scheme to have uh, zero expansion, then this actually needs to be a deterministic function, which we all know can't possibly be in CPA secure. So in fact, if that would be the case, then essentially we have that for any possible length, this algorithm will be implementing a permutation over bit strings of length t. So this is actually something that in reality in cryptography is actually studied. This is sometimes called length preserving encryption, but maybe should be also uh, more appropriately be called length preserving enciphering, since again, 
this is a deterministic process. And it is also sometimes called variable input length uh, block cipher. Uh, but back to our question, we want to achieve more than just PRP security from such a scheme here. So uh, this is actually possible because we can do something about correctness. Namely, we can relax it. And instead of requiring correctness of such a scheme to be perfect, we can require it to be only computational. So in this case, then obviously, EK can't be uh, a permutation anymore on any length for bit strings of length T. And also it seems that it should be a, a stateful algorithm. And so let's define the, the syntax of this object now. So what we have is a pair of algorithms, uh, one for encryption and one for, decry for decryption. They both take uh, a bit string as input and also some state. And we'll output again some bit string and some updated state. So we have different states for encryption and decryption. Now the requirement of these two, on these two algorithms are as follows. So for any uh, key, for any encryption state S and for any uh, decryption state T, we first of all need that these two algorithms are efficiently computable. And also we need that again, they preserve the length. So this means for example, for encryption that on input some message M and some state S, we want that the resulting ciphertext has the same length as the input message. And here the state uh, is something that is kept privately by the sender. It's not uh, something that is transmitted to the receiver. So in the following uh, slides, I will use this notation to indicate that we encrypt a message M under some key K uh, and some state S resulting in ciphertext C, but we also then on the side update the state S to the output state. And also importantly note that in this definition, unlike usually uh, one does, there is no hard-coded notion of correctness. In fact, this will be a separate uh, property that we will have to define later. Uh, so yeah, let's define now security and correctness for such a scheme where this uh, denotes the empty state. So for security, we define this in terms of an advant uh, the advantage of an adversary in distinguishing between two settings. So in the first setting, the adversary is given access to an encryption oracle where the state is updated after each query by the adversary. And in the other uh, setting, the ideal setting, the adversary is interacting with uh, an oracle that simply always gives random bits as output. And for correctness, we define this again in, ter in terms of an advantage of uh, an adversary in distinguishing between two settings. In the first setting, the adversary has, uh, has uh, is given access to an oracle that first encrypts and then uh, subsequently decrypts and also updates the states accordingly. And in the ideal setting, the adversary simply obtains access to the identity function oracle. Uh, let me now show you a scheme that indeed satisfies these two notions. So this is uh, called SCB. So SCB stands for secure, uh, secure code book. Uh, and the name is, uh, has been chosen because this can be uh, seen as a variant or a patch around the insecure scheme ECB. So the observation comes from ECB itself. Uh, if you remember from before, the problem actually uh, is that in ECB, we completely lose security as soon as some block is repeated uh, within or across messages. But if we assume somehow that there's uh, no block that repeats, actually the output of ECB uh, is indistinguishable from uh, random bit strings. But of course, in general, we cannot assume that this is the case. So uh, the idea would be to uh, keep track of the blocks that we've seen so far. And for the blocks that are repeated, we should do something different. We should not encipher them again. Otherwise we will of course, again, lose security, but we should somehow uh, find a way to, to signal to the receiver that the current block uh, is a signal that some previous block was already transmitted. And we are trying to transmit this again. So this of course uh, introduces some problem, namely on the correctness of the scheme. 
because now we want to uh, interpret kind of a subspace of the possible blocks as uh, repetition signals rather than as normal blocks that one might want to transmit to the receiver. But of course, we can kind of be clever about the choice of the subspace in a sense that we can spread it as uniformly as possible over the space of um, uh, blocks. So I will show you next how to concretely do this. So uh, the idea is that we need to define two parameters, sigma and tau, where roughly speaking, sigma will affect security and tau will affect correctness. We also need, uh, first of all, that they add up to at most n, the block uh, size. We, know, we need also a key k1 for the block cipher itself and a second key k2, which will be used as a pad. So we further use a compression function h mapping n bit strings to tau uh, bit strings. Uh, and also a look at table S, which will be the state of encryption, which maps bit strings tau uh, of length tau, so uh, hashes of blocks, to bit strings of length sigma, which will be interpreted as counters within the scheme. And also we'll use this notation to, uh, to mean either the value stored in the look at table under hash H, or the value bottom if no such hash has been uh, stored so far in the lookup table S. So then what we do for each uh, block MI is the following. We first of all get a hash from H of this block and we check whether we saw this hash again in the lookup table uh, S. Now this check here approximates whether MI is a repetition or not. But of course there might be problems here because we might have collisions in the function H since we are mapping to less bits than n. So if this is not the case, then we are actually guaranteed that mi is a new block, which means that we can actually use plain ECB normally. But we also, uh, so we do not only do that, we also set the uh, counter to zero. So we initialize the counter for this particular hash value. So note for the hash value, not for the message. So that's where we have problems for correctness. And if instead we already saw this hash value, so MI is probably a repeated block, but we might also be wrong. Uh, then we have to now uh, signal this to the receiver somehow. And the idea how to do that is that we simply include, uh, we concatenate the hash value, the current counter, and we zero pad this enough uh, to have a block. And then we pad this with the key K2 and we encode this uh, value. So now this will be the current um, block for the ciphertext. And after that, we increase uh, the counter in the lookup table. So this is how encryption works. So uh, for decryption now, uh, the issue is we have to find out whether some particular block of the ciphertext is actually a normal block or is just a repetition signal. And for this, so let's consider again as before, sigma tau, k1, k2, and h. But for the state, we have something different. Now we have a lookup table from tau bits to n bits, which will approximate kind of the inverse of H of the compression function. And what we do for each block now, it's first of all, we uh, simply apply ECB. So we just decode the block. Now what we have to do is to find out whether uh, this block MI has the form of a repetition signal. So for that, we need to see, first of all, are there like, the correct amount of leading zero bits. And second of all, do the last tau bits correspond to a hash value that we have seen before? So if this is not the case, then we are sure that this is not a repetition signal. This was really something that the sender meant to transmit to us. So we keep this MI from plain ECB, but we also keep track of uh, the message, the block message MI corresponding to this hash, hash value. So if this is the case, then CI is probably a repetition signal, but again, we might be wrong. So in this case, we retrieve the current uh, MI from the table rather than from the ciphertext itself. Um, yeah, so in the paper, we show that indeed the two definitions from before are satisfied by this uh, scheme. So we show security by uh, proving that if uh, the block cipher is a PRP secure uh, um, block cipher, then we have the following bound where this term comes from kind of the, the things that could go wrong that I showed you before. And the same for correctness. If you assume that 
H is a collision resistant compression function, then we have the following bound, where again, the additional terms come from uh, the bad events that we might have upon encryption and decryption. And uh, yes, so let's go to the conclusions. So in this paper, we introduced the first NCPA length preserving encryption scheme. And we also use the uh, ciphertext stealing technique that I mentioned in the beginning to extend the scheme to actually handle uh, arbitrary size um, messages. Um, we also consider a variant that is secure and correct even if ciphertexts are reordered when they are transmitted from the sender to the receiver. And we identify also some possible improvements for future work. For example, uh, there is a term in correctness that it's kind of uh, not really ideal, but we believe that this can be easily removed if in the decryption we actually consider also the counters, because if you remember from before in decryption, we actually ignore the counters completely. Uh, it's, it will be also interesting to uh, analyze whether the state uh, growth can be uh, made better because for every encryption and every decryption, the state keeps growing. So it will be interesting to see um, to how, how can we minimize uh, such a growth. And finally, of course, it will be interesting to see whether there are other ways to achieve better security and correctness bounds in this setting. So this is all from my side. I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you. Maybe some quick questions. So any question from Kobe? Uh, there are two questions. Wait. Okay. Okay, th thanks for your presentation. I think it's actually quite a creative uh, problem, well, problem, solution to a problem. Um, I was indeed wondering, you need to get the ciphertext in order. Otherwise, you, you screw up with the stable lookup. And now you say you also have a solution that... Um, can deal mass ciphertext that come in out of order. Does this give an extra loss or, or in the security bound or in the correctness or what's the consequence of this? Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. So security stays uh, the same and one only needs to reanalyze the uh, correctness of the scheme in case of reordering. Yeah. So for that, I also uh, one also needs to introduce a different notion of correctness than the one I have shown before. Uh, I do that in the paper. And then I also prove that uh, the bounce stays essentially the same. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Well, <laughs> thank you for your yeah, nice talk. And uh, yeah, it's quite in inspiring, I think. And uh, so you are in your scheme that uh, you take a hash value for each message, right? Yes. And uh, yeah, of course, it's it's a key idea, uh, but then. Uh, uh, in case of the implementation, uh, maybe uh, so there's a uh, you can compare it with your scheme with uh, now say building a wide block cipher that already have a CPA security. I mean that then uh, this can be basically possible while we first taking a series of the all message hashing into a one block and and making some ECB or counter-like encryption to the rest of the whole messages. Uh, so, yeah, of course, this requires that this means that the, the entire scheme is offline. So, I mean that the first cipher text block is only received from the after receiving the uh, after the last plain text block has been determined. So, it's it's not comparable to. I'm I'm not offending. <laughs> So your scheme is online, but if we, we allow to do a uh, offline encryption scheme, there might be a, a solution uh, without uh, a needing a decryption error. So that's a, that's a baseline scheme. So I, I mean, yeah. Okay, it's... so I'm not sure I understood exactly uh, your idea. So. Uh, maybe we can talk about this offline. But, I mean, yeah. the, really, the strict thing is that I want zero expansion, right? So anything that you do seems to either require to be stateful and also have some incorrectness, or I really I cannot see how you can have something that achieves in CPA security and length preservation and is also perfectly correct. So. Yes. Yes. But then it can't be in CPA, right? 
Sure, sure. Yes, yes, yes. That's what I mean. And uh, thank you. And one, my small comment is, uh, you are using the two keys, right? Yeah. And uh, I think it's uh, it can be reduced to one, but just using uh, some kind of technique, previous technique for building a tweakable block cipher built on the block cipher. Maybe yeah, yeah, exactly, there are yeah. some additional yeah. security loss or a correctness loss, but uh, yeah, it's I think yes. it should be possible. Yeah, yeah, I think you can definitely just use a PRF or something to expand the key initially. And yeah, yes, yes. Thank you. It was just for a easier presentation that I showed two different keys, but you're right. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So, any question from Kobe? Additional question? I think no. Oh, sorry. Can you spend a second and uh, discuss uh, what's the change in your hashing table size for the, in CTS mode, if you did it in counter mode? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? Uh, how would uh, putting this in counter mode affect your hashing tables? Who would what, sorry? Like, how would it affect your hashing? Could you? You mean the CTS? No. Yes. I was just having uh, trouble visualizing that. So you're asking how I can uh, apply CTS to my scheme? Yes. Um, so, so I the way I did it is I just defined uh, kind of uh, the block function of my encryption scheme. So I have an encryption scheme, and I kind of separate like I I look at the code that just handles each block individually, and I take this now as kind of a block cipher, and I apply CTS to this. But uh, I'm not sure I can recall it exactly the details. That's all right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So any questions from Beijing? Or maybe from Nai? Do you have questions from Kobe? No more questions. OK, let's thank the speakers again. So we will have short break, then we'll move to the next section. So thank you.